<laughs> well, good evening. Ooh, there we go. Well, it's good to see everybody out tonight. I am, uh, I'm always fired up when I get the chance to, to teach, to preach, and just be with you all. You are a, a great church family. I love the opportunities that we get to spend together to get fired up about what we're trying to do, and, and which is be like Jesus. For those of you who are new to this class, who have been in Todd's class for the quarter, we're going to be using Don's material tonight. We're going to be talking about just like Jesus. And so what this class has been about for the past couple weeks is looking at Jesus, looking at who he is, what he does, and becoming like him, right? Because we said as being disciples, this is review for a lot of you, being a disciple is not just sitting at his feet. It's not just hearing the message of Jesus, hearing his teaching. But, but for those of you who are, who are in that class, what is a disciple? It's a goal of what? We are not, we are not going to let this auditorium take away our discussion that we've been having in our class, all right? We've been having great discussion. What is a disciple's goal? Be like to be like Jesus. It's not just to sit at his feet, to say, all right, Jesus, I hear what you're saying, but ultimately we want to hear what he's saying and be like him, right? And so we talked about in our class three ways that, that we need to be like Jesus. We need to, oh, uh, that's getting a little bit further. We'll go ahead and throw it up there. <laughs> three ways we need to be like Jesus. We need to conform to his image. We need to look at the image of Jesus. If we want any hope of being like him, we need to conform to the image of Jesus. That means we look at him and we want to be like him. What he does, we do. But that's not just enough, right, to look at him and what he does. We need to conform to the attitude of Jesus. If we're going to be like Jesus, we need to look at his heart, how he thought about things, what his response was to certain things, to look at his compassion. As we, we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago, his forgiveness, how he forgave people. We need to look at the attitude of Jesus. And ultimately, with those two things, we need to walk like Jesus. If we're going to be like Jesus, if we're going to be truly an authentic disciple, a real disciple of Jesus, we need to walk like him. We need to look at Jesus, his image, his attitude, and ultimately implement those things into our life. And so that's what this class has been all about for the past couple weeks over in the other adult classroom. But we said it's easy, right? It's easy to look like Jesus for just a moment or two. It's easy to love the way he did, to have compassion the way he did for just a moment in time, a snapshot in time. But it's a lot harder, right? It's a lot harder to day in, day out, be like him. What do we compare that to? What do we want our lives to be? A video. We want it to be a movie. We want it to be not just this snapshot, just this picture for an hour or two, but we want it to be a video day in, day out, just like Jesus. So that's what we've been trying to do. And so tonight we're going to look at another aspect, another characteristic, another desire of Jesus. And hopefully we can see that this is what we need to be about. If we're going to be like him, which is the expectation of our God, the expectation of Jesus and the other apostles and their writings and Paul, if we're going to meet their expectations to be like Jesus, we need to be about what Jesus was about in this lesson. So that's what we're going to do tonight for those of you who are new to this class and what we've been doing for the past couple of weeks. To, to begin this lesson, now we can go back to it. To begin this lesson, last Saturday, I was watching the game between the Warriors and the Lakers. How many NBA fans do we have in here? Not like diehards or anything, just like no basketball, no the NBA. Watch it. Yeah, cool. Okay, we got a couple. We got three out of maybe like a hundred. All right, so let me give some context to this game. Uh, the Warriors, uh, it's a pretty lopsided game between two teams because the Warriors, on one hand, are a dominant team this season. They, they have the second most, as was last Saturday, the second most wins in the NBA. They're just a powerhouse this season. Steph Curry is on fire. And so they've been doing really well. But on the other side of things, you have the Lakers. And the Lakers, despite all the, the preseason expectations, have, have not been very good at all. They have, uh, as of Saturday, it was 28 wins and 35 losses. Just not a very good season with especially the, the roster that they have. And so, you know, how do you think this game is going to go before, you know, the Warriors are going to win, right? That's what everyone thought. Sports analysts, bettors, commentators, everyone thought this is going to be an easy game for the Warriors. And for a large majority of the game, it was, right? The Warriors are, are going to town on the Lakers. But around the fourth quarter, the guy on the screen starts to take over. He begins to hit basket after basket after basket. The ball's going in his hand. Nobody else's, right? 
is just in LeBron James's hand through the entire fourth quarter. And he became that night one of only four NBA players, if I'm not mistaken, to score over 50 points at the age of 37 or older. So really impressive stat, right? But I love what the commentator said about him. During the game, during the fourth quarter, as I was watching, the commentator called him a man on a mission. A man on a mission, right? One of his teammates, uh, Russell Westbrook, said after the game, once LeBron James gets like this, gets like a man on a mission, there's nothing you can do about it when he's driving to the basket. When we say a man on a mission, what are we trying to communicate when we say that? What are we trying to describe? When we look at someone and we say they're a man on a mission, what are we saying about them? Focused. I like that. That's one answer. Focused. What else? Purpose. Their, their purpose to do this. What else? Determined. Determined. I like it. What else? They won't be denied their goal. I love these answers, right? It's this, this mindset of purpose and determination, and, it, and it's the forefront of their mind, and nothing else is going to get done before I do this, right? My, 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 you know, LeBron James's goal wasn't to get a rest on the sideline. It wasn't to, you know, interact with some fans. What was his goal? To win, to get that, that ball in the basket, right? When we say a person is a man on a mission, they are determined, they are purposed, they are trying to do everything they can to accomplish a goal. And we could, we could fit that description quite often throughout the week, couldn't we, about ourselves. Uh, I was thinking about last week. This was kind of the inspiration for all of this, so you can thank Carrie. Uh, last week, I was walking in the building, and it was towards the, the end of the workday. And I, I really had something I needed to finish before I headed out for the day. And I walk past Carrie, and I give him a wave, and, and he says to me, you look like a man on a mission, right? That we, we can be described that way throughout the week, can't we? Some of you were a man or a woman on a mission this week to get some things done. Some of you might be going on vacation after this. And I love that you're here tonight. That says a lot about you if you are. I love that you're here. Maybe you're going on vacation after this. And, and maybe you've been a man on a mission trying to get everything packed, trying to get everything clean, the dorm room cleaned, right? Trying to get everything done, right? Or maybe you've been trying to get some yard work done or maybe something at the house and you've been a, been a man on a mission, right? Focused, determined that nothing else is going to happen till I get this done. We can fit that description quite often, can't we? But who else can fit that description? Who are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to talk about Jesus, Right? Because while we could fit that description, while LeBron James could fit that description, uh, Jesus is the best, the best person, the most accurate person we could put after a man on a mission. Because certainly, certainly he was. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Looking like Jesus, the man who was on a mission. If we were to say, what is Jesus' mission? What would we say? Just kind of ignore all these transitions. We're, we're catching up. Well, there it is. Seeking to save the lost, right? If I were to ask you what Jesus' mission was, you probably would have said to seek and to save the lost. What text do we find that in? Does anyone know? What story? Luke 19. I love it. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, that's where we're going to be looking tonight, looking at Jesus as the man on a mission. And his mission was, according to Luke 19 and according to Jesus, to seek and save the lost. So I want to read that story together because it teaches us a lot about Jesus and it really shows us that this was his mission. Luke chapter 19, and we're going to read the first 10 verses. Luke 19 beginning in verse, verse 1. And he'd enter Jericho, speaking of Jesus, and he was passing through. And there was a man called uh, the name Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was, was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. And so he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through the way. When Jesus came to this place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they began to grumble and saying, He is gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stooped, or stooped down and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as I owe. Jesus said to him, 
Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so Jesus says what his mission is. His mission is the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And doesn't this story illustrate Jesus' mission so well and so perfectly? Because you have Jesus. You have Jesus coming to this city, entering Jericho, and he's surrounded by people who are praising him, who want to see him. The crowds have formed who want to be with Jesus, as we see over and over again in the Gospels, the people that want to see Jesus and want to praise him as he enters the city. Jesus is surrounded by those people. But who does Jesus speak with in this story? Is it the people praising him? Is it necessarily his fans? Is that who Jesus talks to that day? Who does he talk to? I heard, I heard a sizz over here, right? Zacchaeus. He talked to Zacchaeus, right? Who was Zacchaeus? I, yeah, we, got, we have three descriptions of Zacchaeus here in Luke 19. The Luke, Luke the, and the, the Holy Spirit wants to make it very clear who he is. He's a tax collector, but not only a tax collector. Who else is he? Well, rich tax collector, but not only that. He's the chief tax collector. And so those are the three descriptions of Zacchaeus here in Luke 19. And, and what the Luke is trying to point out, what the, the Holy Spirit is trying to point out is, this is not exactly a follower of Jesus. This is not someone who, who was like the rest of the people there. And, and we know that because how does, how does the crowd describe him? A sinner. It's ironic, right? But that's the adjective they choose to use to describe Zacchaeus. He's, he's a sinner. But Jesus, instead of speaking to the crowd, instead of, instead of staying at their house, he stays at the home of a man who was lost, which would result in him being found. And so I love that story. It perfectly describes to us and shows us, it encapsulates what Jesus was all about. Jesus was all about seeking and saving the lost, as he would say in Luke, Luke chapter 19. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. But this short story also, also teaches us another thing. Uh, and, and also, uh, this is a great time to say, if you have comments, if you want to make a comment, please feel free to do so. I love, I love hearing your thoughts. I love hearing what, what you are thinking about when you read that text. And so if there's any moment, raise your hand. And uh, as Lauren would tell you, she's not here to, to tell you tonight, but I can be oblivious sometimes. And so if I miss your hands, y'all help me out. You guys point to whoever's hand is raised in case I miss them. But uh, so if you have comments, feel free tonight. But in Luke chapter 19, we see some, some things that Jesus wants to make very clear that are not his mission, right? And, and we know these things. We know that Jesus wasn't about these things. And we see that here in Luke 19. This is a story that's very familiar to us. But I think it's important that we go over this, even though, even though we know this, too, because what is our goal? It's to be like Jesus. It's to have the mission of Jesus. And so we need to ask ourselves, when we look inside our hearts, when we look at our mi mission statement, right? In a lot of my business classes, we've had to write mission statements for businesses and companies and products. We need to ask ourselves, what is our mission statement of our heart? Does it resemble these things, or is it like Jesus's mission to seek and save the lost. What I see in Luke chapter 19 is that Jesus's mission was not about public opinion. Jesus's mission was not about public opinion. Obviously, we see this in Luke chapter 19, because are the crowds happy? Are they happy with Jesus for doing this? No. What does it say the crowds did once they saw this? Murmured, right? They murmured. They grumbled. Who does that remind us of? There, there's a couple of right answers in the Bible. We see this pretty, pretty often. It reminds me of the, the children of Israel, right? Speaking of Moses, had they grumbled, had they complained when, they, when they, they looked at Moses and his leadership and his direction that he was taking them, right, as they went to the promised land? That's kind of the impression I got. The crowd is, is grumbling about their leader, Jesus, grumbling about the person they idolize, Jesus, because why? He's, he's eating with the sinner. He's staying with the sinner. And, and what Jesus shows us by doing this is that, that he didn't come to seek public opinion, that wasn't what Jesus was about, but, but he came to seek and to save the lost. And so we need to ask ourselves, what is my mission? Is my mission public opinion? Is my mission to be a people pleaser in life? Because if so, well, then our mission doesn't really align with Jesus because he wasn't making the crowds happy that day. 
But the second thing I see from this is it wasn't about political aspiration. That Jesus shows that his mission was not about political aspiration. Uh, any politician, any person who wanted to be an earthly king or an earthly governor or an earthly lord would have never associated with Zacchaeus because Zacchaeus wasn't exactly a stand-up guy, was he? Zacchaeus not only wasn't someone the crowd didn't like, but, but we can infer Zacchaeus did some shady business, can't we? Uh, Zacchaeus, he, he practices good law and doesn't incriminate himself, but he says, if, Lord, if I have defrauded anyone, and certainly he had. We know that from history that it was notorious for tax collectors, and especially the chief tax collector, to defraud people, to cheat people of their money. If any person wanted to be politician, a politician, a king, a lord, an earthly king, as the Jews wanted Jesus to be, they would have done everything they can to distance themselves from people like this, wouldn't they? We see this in real life. No one wants to be around the, the scandal, right? Jesus, if he wanted to be an earthly king, an earthly governor, an earthly lord, he wouldn't have been around Zacchaeus. He wouldn't have been around that, that adulterous woman at a well, the, the adulterous woman about to be stoned, both of whom were guilty of those sins. Jesus wouldn't have been around the demonic man in Mark chapter 5 who was dangerous, who had a bad reputation. But what Jesus shows us is he's not about political aspiration. He's not a, a, about being with the right crowd, right? So every, there's, no, there's no people around him who are sinners, who are broken, even though the reality is we all are. Jesus shows us that his mission wasn't about political aspiration. It wasn't about gaining power here in this world. And he shows us that by who he associated with. But also I see one more thing, that, that Jesus' mission wasn't about catering. This is in your, your handout, catering to the religious. It wasn't about catering to the religious. I see that in Luke chapter 19, because you have these crowds here. You have these crowds here who are praising him, who want to see Jesus, who have, who have been following him for some time, probably, who have been his followers, his disciples, and they want something of Jesus. They want him to not associate with Zacchaeus. They want him to not associate with the sinners. But what Jesus shows us that day is the crowds, the, the, the opinions of people did not dictate the action of the Son of Man. That Jesus was not concerned about catering to the religious, like we see in the New Testament, right, in the epistles. We see men who, who are all about catering to their flock, all about catering to the church family of God, men who, who tickle the ears of their followers, the people who, who come to them seeking knowledge. We see that in the New Testament with false prophets and false teachers, men who tickle ears, right, who are people pleasers, who are trying to cater to their people. But we see with Jesus is that he's not catering to his people, but he's seeking that one person in the crowd of followers who's lost because he's more concerned about the souls than he ever is the numbers. That's what we see with Jesus and what his mission here is on earth. Is there any comments about this? Any thoughts you had pop into your mind? All right. Well, I, you know, I, I guess we're going to move on. Then. So we need to ask ourselves, am I about these things? Because the devil's going to try to do everything he can in his power, everything he can in his power to make life about these things, to make it about if I'm liked, to make it about being the top dog, to being the person in charge, to being the boss, to, to being the alpha, right? To being liked by the masses. And he's going to tempt us to cater, to twist, to, to, to conform to this world so that, that we, we are, have friends, we have followers, we have people who respect us, who like us, right? The devil's going to try to do everything he can. And so we need to ask ourselves, is this my mission? Am I about these things. But, but as we, uh, I, well, I, let me read this text. I love this text. And it, man, I am, I am not doing well with the clicker tonight. Uh, this text in Mark chapter 2 and verse 16, and, and goes with catering to the religious. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked him, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. And I think that text so perfectly, perfectly closes out those three points. That Jesus didn't come to save the righteous, but he came for the sinners. That's what Jesus is all about. And so as we talked about when we began this class, that, that we need to be like Jesus. That his mission needs to be our mission. And this is the expectation of Jesus. 
This is the expectation that he sets not only for his disciples to be like him, but Jesus wants to make it very clear during his time here on earth, I want my people, my disciples, my followers to be all about my mission specifically. I want them to be all about seeking and saving the lost. We see this in John chapter 20 and verse 21, when, when Jesus is speaking specifically to the apostles, but it's a principle that's going to apply to us, and we see that in other places. In John chapter 20 and verse 21, again, Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Jesus has an expectation that his apostles are going to carry out the mission. We see, we see this in Acts chapter 1, don't we? In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. What is Jesus saying? I want you to go out. I want you to go out all over and continue my mission, to be about my mission, to be witnesses for me. Where else do we see Jesus give this more generally to, to us as disciples and followers of him? Where is Jesus going to tell us we need to be about his mission? Great commission, right? Jesus is going to say, I want my disciples, my people to be all about my mission. And that's going into all the world, right? Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Verse 18. Then Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm always with you, even to the end of the age. I love that last statement by Jesus. And maybe, maybe if we have time, we'll talk about that next class when we talk about evangelism and some excuses we make when it comes to evangelism. We need to remember, man, Jesus is always with us. But Jesus sets an expectation for his followers, doesn't he? for his apostles and for us, that we need to be about the mission. This is the expectation of Jesus. This is what he wants. I want you to go into the world. I want you to seek and I want you to save the lost. I want you to point others to me. And in case we miss it, right? In case we say, well, that was just a message for the, the apostles, right? For the 12, for the 11. Peter wants to make it very clear that this needs to be our mission too. But you are a chosen race, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that we may do what? Declare, some translations say, proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not my people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That is a beautiful verse, isn't it? Man, that is a verse that tears you up on the inside because when we think about what God has done for us, it, it hits us when we read when we read 1 Peter chapter 2. But what does Peter say we need to be about? Proclaiming, declaring, declaring what? How God saved us, how we weren't a people, but now we are. How we were without mercy, but now we found it. Peter says, I want you to be about the mission. I want you to be about the mission of Jesus. I read a quote this week in preparation for this lesson as, as I thought about evangelism. And I, I want to be very, very clear with you, church family. This is something I struggle with, as a lot of us do. Maybe all of us do to some degree. Evangelism is something that's hard for me. And, and we'll talk a little bit, bit about that next class in some ways we can struggle, some ways we do struggle. But as I, as I was reflecting on this class and, and thinking about my own struggles and, and thinking about how for a lot of my life, it hasn't been my mission. This hasn't been my mission to seek and to save the lost. I've been about getting that degree, getting the girl, getting the job, whatever it might be, right? The, the day to day, that's been my mission, right? These hassles that come up. Being an adult is hard. I'll say it a million times. I've said it back there. I'll say it out here. Being an adult is hard. There's a lot of hassles. And a lot of days I find myself where my mission isn't seek and save the lost. And so this, this quote that I'm about to share kind of tore me up when I thought about those times. It says, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Every Christian is a missionary or an imposter. I like that quote because it encapsulates what Jesus wants us to be all about, what he wants his disciples to be all about, what he was all about. Because if we're going to claim to be a Christian, if we're going to claim to be Christ-like, we're going to be like Jesus. So that's what we're claiming about ourselves. If we're going to say we are Christians at the Temple Terrace Church of Christ, 
then we can either be a missionary or an imposter. Because what Jesus shows us is, I'm about a mission. That at my very core, my root, my mission statement, my purpose here in this life is to seek and to save the lost. And so if we aren't doing that, I don't know if we'd go so far to say an imposter, but it certainly encapsulates the point, right? If we're ignoring evangelism, if we're pushing it off, if we're, we're pushing off this, this need to seek and to save the lost, this mission, we need to ask ourselves, does my life really look like Jesus? Because this is what he's all about. This was the mission statement of Jesus. Hudson Taylor would write this. He said, the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. And the thing is, we know this. This is not unfamiliar territory tonight. I'm not teaching something new. I'm not teaching something mind-blowing. You've heard sermon after sermon with Jonathan and Don just encouraging us to evangelize because we've, we, they've shown over and over again from the pulpit, this is God's expectation for us. This is something we should be doing, something we should be about. But what I hope tonight is we're reminded, and we're going we're gonna to talk about some specific application now in just a minute. But I hope we've just been reminded up to this point what we should be about. Because as I said, it, it's hard being an adult. There is a, there's a lot of distractions in life. There's a lot of things that come up. And even though we know this, sometimes it's easy to forget. And the devil's going to do everything he can to try and cause us to forget what our mission is. And so don't think I'm indicting you, church family. As we're going to talk about on Wednesday, I, I've seen the good things you do. I've seen your desire to evangelize. Um, all the elders, all the evangelists, all the, 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 the people at this church could agree that we, we are blessed here to have people in our congregation who want to seek and to save the lost, who have made that their mission. And so please don't think I'm indicting you. If anything, I struggle. I struggle more than anyone in this room to do this. But I hope tonight we've been fired up. We've been encouraged. We've been reminded what we should be about above anything else to seek and to save the lost if we are trying to be like Jesus. And so the, the mission, though, has two components, right? What are the two components to Jesus' mission? Seek and save, right? Those are the two components of the mission. And so if we're going to be like Jesus, we need to have a determination to seek the lost. And so the three points I want to give, any, any comments before we go into this? All right, we're going to keep going. Um, three points I'm going to give about this. It's kind of like a validity test, right? To, to see if I really am about the mission of Jesus. Am I, am I really determined to seek the lost like Jesus was? And so here's three tests that we can ask ourselves. Am I, am I seeking opportunity? Am I seeking opportunity? If I'm determined to seek the lost, then I'm going to be determined to seek and find opportunity for me to evangelize. Uh, to seeking the lost, being determined to seek the lost and seeking opportunity means that we look, look at every circumstance in life, every, every place we go, whether it be the grocery store or the gym or school or work, wherever it is, with lenses of evangelism where we are, we are like Jesus. We are navigating through the crowd, we are, and we are looking for the soul, right? We're looking for that lost soul who desperately needs Jesus, and, and we're looking like Jesus for the person who is seeking, seeking an answer, right? Seeking Jesus. As we go throughout life, as we go into our work and community and school, wherever it might be, to, to be determined to seek the lost means that we have, we have eyes that are looking, we are looking for opportunity. We're looking for Zacchaeus's in the midst, the midst of the crowd. I think about Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35. There can be days where we feel like there's no opportunity, but Jesus wants to tell us that's not the case. As we talked about with service, the devil's going to whisper in our ear over and over again, they don't need you. You aren't needed. There's no opportunity. But we need to be reminded of what Jesus says. And now actually in the context of evangelism, right? We went from service to actually finding ourselves in the context of evangelism. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. When he said, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the field. How does, how does Jesus describe the fields of the world, the lost people? Plentiful. Plentiful, right? That's exactly what I had in my notes. 
Jesus says, I want you to recognize something, that there is a surplus of people who are lost and, and there's a shortage of people who are laboring. Jesus wants us to recognize that, that there is, a, there is a desperate need for people to go out and evangelize. But not only that, there is opportunity everywhere, right? There's opportunity everywhere. There's an opportunity at work. There's an opportunity at school. There's an opportunity in your family. I, I, want, you, I want you to write on your handout. I think it's so important for us to do this. And I, and I did this as a, in preparation for my lesson. I want you to write down three names just to show yourself there is opportunity. Three names that come to your mind when you think of people who are lost, people who desperately need Jesus. You don't have to write out their name fully. Maybe it's just their initials, whatever you want. But there's always people in our life who need Jesus. Countless people in our life who need Jesus. In our homes, in our community, people we know. There's so many people seeking Jesus. And the three names you put down are just countless. Countless of people in this community, countless of people from wherever you put right? And we need to be reminded of that. And, and so when we look at those names and we look at what Jesus is saying, the harvest is plentiful. We need, to, we need to be encouraged. We need to be motivated to serve and to seek the lost as Jesus did. We need to be seeking opportunities to impact, to shine Jesus. We're going to talk about how we evangelize at the very end of this class. So don't think we're, we're skipping over that. Hopefully we'll have time. I, I did off one time. I'll admit, church family, I did off one time last time I teached. I had like three pages left. And so, so we shortened it down. We shortened it down a bit for this class. But we need to be asking ourselves, am I seeking opportunities to shine? Am I seeking opportunities to teach? Am I seeking opportunities to invite people to church? Am I determined to do that because the harvest is plentiful? But the next thing I see is that being determined to seek the lost means that we're praying for opportunity. If we're truly about seeking the lost, if that is what we want, if we are determined like Jesus, that I'm going to seek the lost then we're going to be praying about it. Because this is what Paul would say in Colossians chapter 4. It's not a text on your screen, but I'll read it for you. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 3, praying at the same time for us as well, that God would open up to us a door for the word so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I have been in prison. If we are determined, if we are determined like Jesus to seek sinners, then we should have a prayer, shouldn't we? A prayer that says, Jesus, give me opportunity. Lord, give me opportunity. We, we don't need to have an attitude that says, because if we had this attitude, we're really not determined, are we? An attitude that says, well, I really don't see any opportunity in my life. I, I really don't see any, any people like Zacchaeus who, who are looking for Jesus. I don't really, really see anybody that, that I can invite to church. I've, I've kind of burned some bridges. Maybe I don't have a lot of friends. Maybe I, I just know no one at work will ever, ever come, ever listen the, the gospel message. What we, need to, what we need to realize is that we don't need to have an attitude that says, there's no opportunity, I'm good, I can lay back, I can relax. But we need to have an attitude of desperation. An attitude where, where when we don't see, see any opportunities, we're not saying, well, it's time for me to lay back, but it's time for me to pray, to seek opportunities. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes our opportunity is not necessarily walking up to people and preaching to them mm -hmm. or teaching at them or giving them Bible verses. Oftentimes it's showing them the fruits of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. We will teach a much better lesson and show true love because then we aren't that imposter mm -hmm. who just comes up to people and says, Oh, you're yeah, hungry, be still, yeah. be warm, go on your way, but actually show love, show joy, mm -hmm. show Yeah, I, I love that point. And, and so many, so many people that we've had come to this church family are a testament to that. You've come just because you've noticed the, the way people treat you, the way that you've been welcomed at this church family, the joy, the, just the Christ-like attitude that people have of service. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that with evangelism in, in our final four points. That evangelism is not always, you know, opening up a Bible and saying, here, you know, here's Acts 2.38. But it, it, we're going to talk about that next class, too. It always, it always cracks me up when you're—we're we're making a detour now. We're making a detour, getting off the notes. My mom would be worried right now. She said, Carson, always stick to the podium. And so, so we're getting away from that. But uh, it always cracks me up. Well, I guess it shouldn't crack me up. I guess it makes me a little sad, and it's a little funny at the same time. When you see people holding those signs like, like judgment is coming, you know, get right with the Lord, right? Nobody's going to look at that and say, oh, right, I, I want to have a Bible study with that person, right? 
But sometimes all it is, evangelism, all it is, is shining the light of Jesus, shining the light of Christ, serving, but not being served. I like that point. Back to the notes now. And so we need to be praying for opportunity. We need to be seeking, seeking opportunity. And when we don't have it, we need to be having a prayer. If we're truly determined to seek the lost, we're going to be praying, Lord, give me opportunity. Put people in my life that I can talk to. Put people in my life who, who are seeking answers. Lord, bless me with those opportunities. I love this quote. It says, the man who mobilizes the Christian church to pray will make the greatest contribution to the world of evangelism in history. But we should add, as Don likes to say from, from the pulpit, and you've heard this numerous times, what are we doing after the amen? Are we just praying that prayer and then we're not really determined to seek and save the lost? Are we just praying that prayer out of repetition as we talked about in the prayer class? Or are we praying that and we're truly anxious and we're awaiting and we're going to act when we see opportunity? Uh, one last thing about being determined to seek the lost and that is, if we're truly determined to seek the lost, if this is, if this is our mission, if this, was, this is what we're about, right? If we're going to look like Jesus, we need to be zealous for more. We don't need to be complacent with, with the people we've, we've found, the people that we've sought, but we need to be zealous for more. We see this with Jesus, don't we? We don't see Jesus, you know, saving one person at the beginning of the gospel and saying, well, I'm done, right? I, I did what I came to do. I saved one person. I did my job. I bore my fruit. I evangelized. I'm good to go. But I think a lot of times, and again, I've been there. Uh, I remember the first person I baptized. It was uh, for, for weeks and maybe months. I, I looked at that, and every time I heard, a, I heard a sermon on evangelism, I would say, check, right? I did it. I helped, I helped steer, someone, steer someone to Christ, right? And as Paul would say in Corinthians, it's not anything that we did, right? But God caused the growth. God caused the increase. But I helped steer someone to Christ. I did my job. I did my evangelism, right? Check. And a lot of times we can develop this attitude that because I've, I've helped someone come to know the gospel, because I've invited someone to church, because I've let my light shine, that, that I'm good to go, that I've done it. But really that, that attitude that attitude is opposite to Christ. That is nothing like Jesus because Jesus didn't come to save one person, but his mission was to seek and to save the lost. Not a checklist of how many people he got, but a mission and attitude that my life is all about seeking opportunity and seeking the lost with a goal that, with hopes and a goal that he would save them. As Paul would say in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21, for me to live is Christ and for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And if I'm going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Being like Jesus, having his mission is a mindset. It's not a, a you know, I, I saved someone I, or I helped someone be saved or I taught someone the gospel or had a Bible study with someone, but it's a mindset for me to live as Christ. Day in, day out, be like him and just be zealous for more. Any thoughts about that before we get to the second component? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, and and I, I I hate that we are. I mean, I wish we could just have a Paul moment where we just go to midnight, right? Because when I break up these lessons, you know, sometimes we have to skip over things. But next class, we're going to talk about that, right? You know, we're seeking, we're seeking, we're seeking, and then oops, we're seeking, we're seeking, we're seeking, and then the opportunity comes, and then the devil says, "Hey, hey, you might get rejected, right?" Or, or maybe you don't know. You don't know what they know, right? They know more Bible than you. They're going to walk all over you, right? And, and so when we pray that prayer, we need to be mindful that when God puts opportunities in front of us, we don't need to be, we need to be bold. We need to, to do what we said we're going to do, and that is the mission of Jesus, seeking to save the lost, right? We need to be ready to answer that prayer when we pray it, when God answers that prayer. I like that point. Anything else? The, the second component the second component of this is, is a determination to save the lost. A determination to save the lost. We've got about five minutes, so we're going we're gonna to pick it up. We're going to hit that 60 miles an hour right now. We were going at 40. And so the, the second part of this is saving the lost, right? And we, when we say that our, our mission is to save the lost, what are we, what are we not saying? 
yeah, we're, we're not saying we're like Jesus, we're the ones doing it by our power, our might, right? What are we saying? We're, we're teaching them, we're, we're pointing to Jesus, the one who can save them, right? And so when we, save a de- when we say a determination to save the lost, that's what we mean, right? In no way am I trying to say that we save them personally, right? We can't do that. As, if I, if I, as I've gotten to talk about up, up there about in the Lord's Supper uh, communion meditations, you know, our, we deserve death. I mean, we can't save nothing, right? We are bankrupt before God, but Jesus can. So when we say that, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. We need to help people recognize their wrongs, recognize Jesus, the answer, and recognize that he is willing and he is able to save them. And, and, and what this means is, and it's actually in my notes, that's cool. What this means is, is that we need to be about action rather than avoidance. And we need to be about speaking rather than staying silent. That's what a determination to save the lost is. It's when opportunities come, we, we refuse, we, we determine that we're not going to remain silent in both speech and action, right? Because the, the evangelism is more than just speaking, right? We've established that, and we're going to give four ways we can evangelize at the very end of this class. But evangelism is more than just speaking. It's also actions. It's also letting our light shine. But opportunities can come, right? We see these opportunities for us to evangelize, for us to let our light shine, and, and then we, we say, well— Maybe not. Maybe I'm not going to do that. Maybe there's a coworker, and somehow a religious conversation comes up at work. And yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. We're in, in the next class. Man, I keep saying that. I, I again hate. I wish we could just have a Paul moment and keep on going. We're going to talk about the woman at the well. And we're going to talk about Jesus and, and his evangelism lessons from the woman at the well. But what we see in that entire lesson is that, that the key to evangelism, the very foundation of le- evangelism is love. It's love for the soul. It's love for that individual who is lost, who is, who is destined for eternity away from the presence of God. And it's seeing them and wanting desperately because we love them for them to change their ways and to come to know Jesus. That's a great point. Um, what we're saying, uh, let, me, let me see here, is that, that when we, we have these opportunities in front of us, maybe a, re, a religious conversation comes up at work, and, and we think this is a great opportunity. This is a great opportunity for me to, to evangelize, to, to invite them to church, maybe say something about what I believe, or maybe ask about what they believe, but yet we end up remaining silent. That's happened countless times in my life, and I'm sure it's happened countless times in yours. We are like a farmer, to be very frank. A farmer who sees the harvest, as Jesus would say. See that it is ready to be harvested. But we begin to make excuses, and we don't act upon the opportunity to go out and harvest the field. I remember this happening countless times in high school, where, where God would put opportunities, where he, he, put, he put doors in front of me. And while I was determined to seek the lost— I was not determined to save. I wasn't determined to speak and act. And so we need to be reminded tonight. And we're going to talk about these excuses next class that we can make that will deter us from acting. But, but simply just surface level tonight, we need to be encouraged. We need to be reminded that we are called to speak and we are called to act. And that if we are truly determined, if my life is truly about this, then that's what I'm going to do. Because we see Jesus over and over again speaking and acting in a way that maybe was contrary to what people wanted, in a way that maybe made people uncomfortable. So if we're going to be determined to save the lost, we need to be, we need to be willing, we need to be determined to act. I love this quote. I love this quote. You're the only Bible son, um, some unbeliever will ever read, and your life is under scrutiny every day. What do others learn from you? Do they see an accurate picture of your God? I love that quote because often we can be situations in life where, where God is saying, I want you to show me. I want you to tell about me. I want you to, to show a person what it is like to be a Christian and the benefits and the blessings of being a Christian. But sometimes, often, we can say, oh, I don't think so today. I'm going to avoid that. I'm not going to talk about that. And for reasons we'll talk about next class. But we need to, be, we need to remember that God wants to use us to bring others to him. So very quickly, this is not on, this is not on your, your, the screen. But as Don and I talked about 
talked about this class and, and what I wanted to do and, and some things he wanted me to include. He, he included some, some great points as we had a discussion, and he, and he talked about ways we can evangelize. And so I want to give you those four points tonight in just the concluding two minutes or so. And, and the first is this. These are, these are things for everyone, too. We can all do this. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be an elder or a deacon, whatever it might be. These are ways every one of us, from college to the experienced Christian, right, every one of us can evangelize. The first is this on your handout, shine. The first way we can evangelize is shine. This is what Jesus tells us to do. To let our light shine before men so they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Peter would talk about in his epistles how, how spouses of unbelieving partners are to shine so they may convert their spouses. This is a way we are to evangelize that God makes very clear in the Bible that we are to let our light shine so, so people can see us. No, why? So they can see God through us, so we can reflect. So we need to shine. The second thing is, I hear children coming. They're coming. The second thing is, speak. We can all speak, right? Uh, and that doesn't mean you have to be a preacher. It doesn't mean you have to be a Bible class teacher. But what that means is we all have an ability, and all an ability to bring Jesus into the conversation to bring religious things into the conversation, to bring church into the conversation. You know, we live in a world full of insecurity, a world full of turmoil. Maybe we can bring Jesus into the politics conversation at work. Maybe politics at school, right? When we're, when we're talking about Ukraine and this terrible situation in Europe, we can talk about how we have, we have Jesus who gives us security. He gives us peace in the midst of all the storms in life in the valleys. The third thing is this, invite. This is probably the easiest thing we can do, right? Just to invite someone to church. A simple form of evangelism. Maybe go grab one of those cards out there on your way out. All you got to do is you walk up to them and say, man, I'd love to see you on Sunday. I'd love to see you on Wednesday. Come and see. Come and see, as the apostles would say. We all have the ability to invite. Last way we can evangelize is welcome. I think this may be the most, most important, if there is a most important on this list. A lot of times we can come here, and it's easy to sit with our people, to sit in our spots, to talk to our people, but we have a great opportunity to evangelize. In the sense where if we have visitors with us, if we have people from the community, let's go and talk to them. Let's go welcome them into our family. That, that's all the time we got tonight. Um, we're going to pick up on this on Wednesday and talk about evangelism and excuses and the woman at the well. Thank you all so much. <laughs>